So now, I'm speaking to you all, and you're all irritated because your life has been really awful for 15 years. And I'm saying this, and I'm saying that, and I'm saying this, and I'm saying that. You know, and then I say something, maybe I say something uh, initially uh, dismissive of Jews. And you're all mad, and there's two or three people who go, yeah. And then I think, oh, well, you know, that's kind of an interesting response. And then, you know, I lay out a couple more ideas, and some of them don't get any response. And others, you know, people perk right up. And, and I'm not stupid, and I'm trying to get the bloody attention of the crowd. One piece of evidence is that if you take a cat's brain off, out, and you just leave it with a hypothalamus and a spinal cord, it's hyper-exploratory. It runs around like everything's interesting. It's pretty weird behavior for a thing that doesn't have a brain. You know, you kind of think that once you don't have a brain, nothing would be interesting. Anyways, for whatever reason, you know, people turn to possession by very, very strict ideological ideas. And, you know, they were willing to be possessed by those ideas to the point where they would undertake actions that you'd think would be completely impossible for theoretically civilized people. You know, it turned out that those actions not only were not impossible for civilized people, but that the people themselves, you know, especially in Nazi Germany, they pretty much knew what the hell was going on, you know. You don't take several million people out of your population without rumors spreading, let's say. And so, you know, we should never forget that Hitler was elected. You know, and he was elected by a large majority, too. It was a landslide vote, the kind of vote that no modern democratic leader ever gets. So, you know, although it's difficult to, it's difficult for people to swallow, um, it's hard not to assign culpability for what happened in Germany to the society at every strata. You can't just dump it on the leaders. And, and in fact, one of the things, that here's, here's something to think about with regards to Hitler. So because one of the things you might ask is, how the hell could he be so so absolutely compelling to his audiences. But here, here I'll give you an explanation. So let's, let's, make the, let's make a few assumptions. And the first assumption is, there are a lot of resentful Germans kicking around. Why? Well, they lost the First World War. That wasn't so good. And then... There were a lot of brutal men left because they'd been in the trenches and they'd been shooting, fighting and shooting at each other under absolutely abhorrent conditions for like years and years. And so there were plenty of brutalized men around. Um, and then their whole damn economy collapsed because they were forced into signing what historians regard as a very punitive peace treaty. And so, like, everything had fallen apart to a degree that we can't even begin to imagine. And so, you know, in the 1930s, the Germans were starting to get back on their feet. And, and um, when Hitler came to power, he started not only to rearm, but to reindustrialize the economy. And he was actually pretty damn good at that.
Now, Hitler was a good orator, but he, but he, it isn't exactly clear that he was a, a coherent philosophical theorizer, although to think of him as stupid is, is completely missing the point. He was by no means stupid. Um, I wouldn't say that he was particularly educated, but he had a very powerfully developed aesthetic sense, and he spent a lot of his time designing the cities that would be built after World War II was over, and those cities were generally conceptualized by him as places where the arts, or at least the Nazi version of the arts, could flourish. You know, so there's no real evidence that what was wrong with the Nazis was that they weren't civilized. There's more evidence, actually, I think, that they were too civilized. And I'll talk to you about that later. But anyways, you think, how did Hitler get all these people under his spell? Well, here's a hypothesis that's basically derived from Jungian thinking. And I should let you know, by the way, because sometimes Jung has been accused of being an anti-Semite. And there's various reasons for this, partly because of what happened during World War II, and partly because um, his theory drew heavily from Christianity, although from many other sources as well. And he did believe that there were differences in the psychology of people with different ethnicities. And now, you know, whether that's racist or not depends on whether or not you like the person you're talking to because the lefties think that there are cultural differences and they're important, but if you ever talk about them in the wrong way, then you're racist. And the right-wingers, well, they just think there are ethnic differences to begin with. So it's a tricky, it's a tricky issue. If there aren't differences that are important, then who the hell cares about multiculturalism? It's not even worth preserving. And if there are differences, well, then you're stuck with having to deal with the differences. So you're basically screwed either way. So... Anyways, Jung has been the target of many accusations of anti-Semitism, particularly by biographers who were resentful and clueless and historically uninformed and, um, I would say, malevolent, fundamentally. He was a compelling person, and the fantasy that he had in the back of his mind, I'll tell you how that developed at one point. It was a very hard thing to escape from. And that's why the Germans became Nazis. It wasn't like, this was like magic that had emerged, and it was black magic. So Jung was very interested in this because he was in the Germanic-speaking areas of the world when this happened, and he felt, felt himself pulled very strongly by what the Nazis were doing, especially in the early stages of the development of the political platform, because things did stabilize. Um, he worked as a CIA agent, it was just revealed last year, and he, he he provided psychological reports to the American government on the underlying psychological structure of the Nazi leaders for years. And he never told anybody about that while he was alive. It only came to light, like it only came to light, as far as I know, last year or perhaps the year before that. So,
So anyways, the Germans, you know, they weren't very happy about the whole damn situation. And so when they were aggregating en masse, you think, well, what happens when all people get together in a group? You know, we talked about that last time when we talked about Kierkegaard's idea that as soon as you get a bunch of people together, no matter how truthful they are all as individuals, instantly the crowd is not a truthful thing. And so, you know, the fact that somebody might go along with the crowd, you know, you can, you can, you can blame that on their on their ability to be social and conventional, which in many ways is a huge advantage, because if you are all antisocial and unconventional, you know, I mean, there'd be a good chunk of you in jail, and we certainly wouldn't be having this, you know, delightful, peaceful conversation that we're having. So, you know, you don't want to underestimate the utility of conventionality to too much of a degree. And so the reason I'm telling you that is because it's pretty obvious that people can respond to the cues that a crowd is delivering. You know, and a good speaker does that, right? So a good speaker does a variety of things. And one is he never talks to the, to the crowd per se. You know, you pick out specific individuals and talk to them, and they're sort of reflective of the crowd. And then you can tell if everybody's understanding. And uh, the other thing that a good speaker does is pay attention to the damn responses of the crowd. Hitler, he's kind of a chaotic guy, you know. He's very angry. He's angry in part because he was a frustrated art student. He tried to get into art school like four times, so really the person to blame for World War II was the four-person committee that wouldn't let poor Hitler into the, I believe it was the Viennese School of Art, because he really wanted to go. You know, and he had some artistic talent. He was a little on the conventional side, by all appearances. But, you know, I've seen some of his sketches, and, you know, he wasn't a complete piker. he kind of felt maybe it would be okay for him to go to university because he'd just been through World War I, you know, and that wasn't much fun. There's a story about Hitler where he was out on, in the trenches and he was there with all his buddies and he wandered off to do whatever he wandered off to do and when he came back they were all dead because a bomb had landed right in the middle of them. And, you know, you might think that would do a little something to your psyche because after an experience like that you're either going to think, oh man, things are pretty damn random and horrible or there's, pretty, there's something pretty damn special about me because I wasn't killed by the bomb, you know. Maybe God has saved me for a higher purpose. I mean, you can be absolutely sure that if you went through an experience like that, that something like that would be rattling around in your mind. And he won a, he won a medal for bravery. You know, so he kind of, and then after World War I, he kind of wandered around like a lot of men, unemployed and sort of like a tramp, you know. So he wasn't very happy about that, and, and you know, no wonder. So anyways, he didn't get into art school. Now, he didn't really have a fully developed political theory, you know. And, but he was pretty good at speaking. So, and there were lots of people who had come to, to, to hear him speak because people were sort of trying to figure out what the hell to do about all the chaos, you know.
So then you think, well, what, did Hitler, what was Hitler good at? So now, I'm speaking to you all, and you're all irritated because your life has been really awful for 15 years. And I'm saying this, and I'm saying that, and I'm saying this, and I'm saying that. You know, and then I say something, maybe I say something uh, initially uh, dismissive of Jews. And you're all mad, and there's two or three people who go, yeah. And then I think, oh, well, you know, that's kind of an interesting response. And then, you know, I lay out a couple more ideas, and some of them don't get any response, and others, you know, people perk right up. And, and I'm not stupid, and I'm trying to get the bloody attention of the crowd. And so, if I do that 50 times, the crowd's going to tell me an awful lot about what they want, especially if I'm willing to follow them. And I can do that easily, because especially if I can start to work the crowd a little bit, because I can capitalize on their emotional, on their emotional capitalize on their emotions and the display of that emotion, and I can learn to play that. And then that turns into a positive feedback loop. And so Hitler's informing the audience, and the audience is informing Hitler, and that's why Jung believed that Hitler embodied the shadow of the German people. Now, these guys were all concerned with that sort of thing. They were highly concerned with it. Now, Binswanger and Boss had both been influenced by Freud and by you. You can see in the bottom right-hand corner there, that's uh, Boss with you. And, and that's Binswanger on the left and Boss at the top there. So, you know, they're, they're pretty thoughtful-looking guys, and they were pretty damn smart. And they were quite philosophically oriented, and they had both studied Heidegger, and they both studied Husserl, who were German philosophers. Uh, Heidegger actually got tangled right up in, into the Nazi movement and you know his philosophy has been cast under a cloud of suspicion, perhaps a well-deserved cloud of suspicion, as a consequence of his cooperation with the Nazis. So it wasn't only stupid people who got tangled up in this, it was pretty much everybody who got tangled up in it. And one of the things you might, be, might think about, and this is worth thinking about, is that if you were there, for any one of you, there's a 90% chance that you would have got tangled up in it. You, know, you wouldn't have been the person who rescued the gypsies. It's like, forget that. like unless you think that you know you're heroic far beyond the average and I would be very very careful about assuming that you could assume instead that you would have been swept along with the crowd just like everyone else because everyone else was all right now part of what these guys were trying to figure out is in some sense there were two things there was the the, the function and structure of belief systems, and then the nature of that which transcends a belief system. And the reason they were interested in that is because they thought, well, maybe it would be a good, good idea if our belief systems didn't get so damn pathological. Because if they do, then, you know, 6 million people end up in ovens or the equivalent, and 120 million people end up dead in battlefields. You know, that doesn't count the Stalin massacres or Mao, who were, you know, made Hitler in some sense look like an absolute amateur, 
I mean, Stalin starved six million people to death in the Ukraine in the 1930s, and he was just warming up. You know, I don't know how many, how many of you have heard of the Ukraine famine? How many of you haven't? Yeah, well, think about that. You know, how many of you knew Mao killed 100 million people? How many of you didn't? Yeah, well, you might think about why you don't know that. You know, you know about the damn Nazis, but you don't know about the horrors that the communists perpetrated. It's worth thinking about why. Because the communists, especially the Maoists, man, those people were brutal. Intellectually manipulative left-wing thinkers, I would say, that's basically their, their routine. You know, they reduce everything to a single damn motivation. It's usually economics or power. Then they explain everything from that perspective. It's like, it's so boneheaded, it should be illegal. Anyways. I mean... No matter what you say about the Catholic Church and its basic barbarism, especially when, you know, they were involved in the witch hunt in the Middle Ages, it's like, those guys, <laughs> they were amateurs compared to the fascists and the communists, you know, they were counting their victims in the tens of thousands, not the hundreds of millions. And I don't know if you know this, you can tell me how many of you know this. Do you know that a hydrogen bomb uses an atom bomb for its trigger? And they took that from Heidegger, because Heidegger thought that Western philosophy had gone off, got off on the wrong track, you know, 3,000 years ago, um, because we didn't really concentrate on being itself. You know, so in Auschwitz, for example, one of the little tricks that the guards used to do was to, you know, they bring the Jews off the freight cars. A lot of them had died in the freight cars because they were packed in there like this, you know, so lots of them would suffocate or the old ones would die or the little kids would die. And that was okay. You know, and then on, along the outside of the freight cars, especially if it was winter, well, it's like 20 below, and so the ones on the outside would freeze, but, you know, you were going to get rid of them anyway, so that was just convenient, mostly. So then you'd take them to Auschwitz, and they'd all spill out, speaking different languages, torn up from their family, you know, as miserable as people can possibly be. And then one trick was to have, you know, someone who was not quite dead enough pick up a sack of a, wet, a sack of wet salt, so that's 100 pounds, and carry it from one side of the compound to the other, and then back, you know, one side and then back. And, you know, you don't want to be thinking about these camps as like, like a football field. These bloody things were cities. They were big. They held tens of thousands of people. And so there's some guard, he thinks that's a pretty good joke. And it's not just a few people that are like that. And we found out from the Stanford Prison Experiment, which every psychologist likes to think of as immoral, you know, because we actually discovered something with it, that if you gave ordinary people the opportunity to be fascist barbarians, in six days, 30% of them would be. And, you know, what we learned from that is that social psychologists shouldn't run the Stanford prison experiment. That's not the right conclusion to draw. So, 
So these phenomenologists, are all, we're all concerned about this. It's like, what the hell should we do about that? Maybe I say something uh, initially uh, dismissive of Jews. 